So thanks very much everyone for coming along to the second Data Science Under the Hood seminar for, for this year. Uh, my name is Christian Vandy and I'm one of the program directors in CDS. And it's a real pleasure today to introduce our speaker who is uh, David Warren. So David is a postdoc within the centre. And prior to that, he was a uh, postdoc at ASENS, which is the Australian Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. And then prior to that, David was a PhD student within the School of Mathematical Sciences at QUT. And even in a previous life before that, David was, he actually worked for the high performance com computing team at QUT. Um, so David's research is, is mainly focused on developing new mathematical models and statistical methodologies to tackle challenging real world problems involving interacting, interacting populations, especially in ecology, biology and epidemiology. And also the great thing about David is he's got all these great skills with HPC, so he's able to really exploit those skills to, to tackle some really computationally challenging problems in um, computational statistics and data science. So I think that's it from me. Now I'm going to pass it over to David, who is going to talk about um, multi-level Monte Carlo, which will be really interesting to hear about. And so David will talk for about 40 to 45 minutes or so. Um, and then afterwards, there's going to be an opportunity for questions. But if you have any questions during the presentation, please don't hesitate to type them into the chat or the Q&A windows. And then, then David can address those at the end. So I'll pass it over to David now. Thanks, Chris. Um, thanks for the introduction and thanks everyone for attending uh, my talk. Um, I thought before I get started, I, I wanted to talk about the thing that I spent the most time on with, the, with this talk, and that was the title. And in particular, the, the key word here being telescopic. Uh, this is two things. This uh, both is a bit of a play on words for the, the methods we're going to be looking at, multi-level Monte Carlo. But also it sort of is a bit of the style of this talk as well in that we're going to start a fair way away from multi-level and really talk about a few methods that and concepts that are really needed first uh, for those who are not familiar with these sorts of computational problems um, and then eventually we will zoom in on some of the nitty-gritty detail but not too much i, I promise it, it's uh, this should be fairly fairly friendly okay so i do want to acknowledge some people so firstly um, Matthew Simpson and Ruth Baker, who are both my uh, our PhD supervisors, uh, they uh, guided me along uh, a number of projects related to these methods. Um, Tom Prescott, who is a current collaborator of mine, working on some some new techniques along with Ruth and, and Matt. And finally, uh, Mike Giles, who really was the sort of the multi-level is really his brainchild. Um, and, and Chris Lester, they, I, I've had a lot of conversations with these two and they've really helped, uh, particularly in the early stages of this work, get a feel for what exactly is going on and how these things all work. And then also funding uh, from ASEM, Centre for Data Science, and the Australian Mathematical Society who have given me a lift-off fellowship to work with, with Tom on, on some projects. Okay, so. The first thing is our motivation for this whole thing. And really, this is all about stochastic uh, systems. So the real world has a lot of stochastic systems that we're pretty familiar with, even if we don't realize it. So we have finance systems, uh, they are heavily stochastic. And what I mean by stochastic in this sense is not just having observation error. We're talking about noise or randomness that's an inherent part of the dynamics of these systems. A similar one we were pretty used to uh, last year in particular was ep epidemics. Uh, they follow uh, stochastic patterns as well. And then on another level, we know that a lot of cellular processes, particularly intracellular processes like gene expression, um, are, have inherent stochasticity as well, or intrinsic stochasticity. Uh, because of these combinations of uh, 
very small populations of, of certain biochemicals that have a big influence in, in the dynamics. So there's that randomness occurring on, on that level. So as a particular example, which uh, this is an equation that's a bit scary, but when we don't need to focus on it too much. Um, this is probably the main application that I've dealt with for these sorts of methods. And so we have a biochemical reaction network. So this is a bit like it could be a gene regulatory network or something like that. And so we have X as a vector of populations of chemical species. So each dimension is like the number of, of chemicals of that particular type, like protein or gene or mRNA or something like that. And they interact according to some reactions. We have M reactions. And these are just like your chemical equations from high school, um, but it's just written in a general form. So these new minus and new plus uh, represent the, I guess, the number of molecules involved as react reactants and products from the, from the particular reaction. And we have this rate parameter, which tells us how, you know, I guess, how, how rapidly these things occur, how often these things occur. And finally, if you take the difference of these things, uh, you can get the, the, the state change if reaction J occurs. As an example, we have this michaelis menten enzyme connects. It's a simple example just to uh, explain the, the full process. We have four species. So we have a substrate that reacts with an enzyme uh, to form a complex, and then that that enzyme converts the substrate into a product. We have these three reactions. Uh, these are the updates involved for each of these reactions. And the final thing we need for this is these so-called propensities. And you can think of these a little bit like a, a I guess it's like an instantaneous probability, or a, I guess you'd almost say a, it's like the they're not quite a probability if you need to you need to consider the time time interval to turn them into a probability. It's like some sort of instantaneous probability, the, the, the number of possible combinations of chemicals that could collide to cause this reaction to occur. And it's that scale by the rate parameter. This is just a pretty little schematic to show us roughly what's going on. And here are four simulations, stochastic simulations of this process for particular initial conditions and some rate parameters. And you can see that you know each realization gives us a different trajectory, and that means we need to think about you know how we even interpret uh, the behavior of these things. And so we can simulate these things exactly. We have this method called Gillespie's method, and Gillespie's method, without going into details, we basically progress the simulation by randomly generating a new reaction time, and then randomly choose which reaction is going to happen. Now those probabilities are dependent on the state of the system, but that's enough detail um, for this. Uh, and we just, we just update the state and update the time and continue until some terminal time. In terms of applications, we're often looking at some average behavior that we're interested in. And that uh, comes in the form of this uh, expectation integral um which provide f is well behaved there's not many limitations on f but uh basically we changing different f's will give you different properties so for example uh we can get the mean if f is this f of x of t equals x of t that gives us the mean the average state we can also get the variance and if we use like some sort of step function for our for our f this can lead to uh, the cumulative probability distribution as well. So there's a lot of things we can, it's a very general sort of uh, problem to look at the properties of the distribution that come from this, uh, from this system. Uh, we don't ever have, well, we rarely have access to these things directly. So we need to use lots of simulations. In particular, uh, let's, let's say here we've got, uh, so four realizations from before, you see that if we ramp this up to 100, we're starting to see more of a, a distributions forming here. So you can see that this gives you some intuition of, of 
uh, how we can use simulations to, I guess, uh, draw samples from this distribution. And we can then approximate our expectation uh, just using the, the average function value of all these realizations. So this is just a normal old boring average. Uh, but it shares some interesting properties uh, with the expectation we're interested in, because even though f hat here, the es estimated expectation, is a random variable, uh, as n goes to infinity, we know that this, uh, this f hat goes to the expectation that we want, and the various variance also shrinks proportional to one on n. Now, depending on the variance of your system, and how accurate you want your estimate in terms of precision, uh, you could need a very large value of n. And for the this kind of exact simulation, this is prohibited because you're simulating every single reaction of n. If you have a lot of molecules, this is, this is bad, uh, very costly. So we can do some approximations and the aim is to reduce the cost of each simulation. And the key approximation here is that you assume those propensities that depend on the state, these instantaneous uh, probabilities, you assume they're constant over some small time interval, tau. And then we step like this, instead of generating uh, times and reaction events and things like that, we draw some counting random variables for each reaction uh, that we have in our system and that, that counts the number of events that are likely to occur over that, uh, over that time interval from t to t plus tau. And then we do all the updates together um, and just keep doing that until we reach the end. And the nice thing here is we have a fixed compute time, well, not compute time, but we have a fixed number of steps. And depending on the actual reactions you're looking at, once you define your, your, your reaction network, this, this should be constant. Um, the uh, as in the, the cost should be should be constant for the same tower. So if you do a thousand simulations, you can basically if you do ten simulations and time it, you can use that to work out how long it's going to take to do a thousand. The downside is this is no longer exact, and this is where the problem lies. So because these simulations aren't exact, our expectation that we compute with these things is not going to equal the thing we really want. So we need to think about this a little bit. And this is just an example of the Gillespie method for the same michaelis uh problem before, and a tau leaping simulation where we've got tau set to two, so two seconds. And you can just see that the, the nature of these things is a bit different. We need tau to be smaller to get it looking closer to this. Um, so it's about how small do we need tau? And this is where so the computational challenge lies that multi-level is going to help us along with. Okay, so I'm gonna go, go through this um, a little bit slower because I'm not sure exactly you know, how much sort of background everyone has in terms of the way it, Monte Carlo estimates expectations work. So we're just going to say let's let's suppose we just used our our uh, tau leap approximation for whatever tau, um, and we're going to use that as an approximation for the expectation we want. And so we want to choose tau that's small enough so we can so we can reliably say this. And I'll explain what this means a little bit more. In that we want the expectation we're interested in to be pretty much approximate to the expectation that we really want. And then on top of that, we've got to deal with the Monte Carlo uh, error in, in terms of variance and precision, et cetera, um, from before. So this is the sort of thing we're looking at now. Now, how do we choose what, uh, what tau is small enough? Uh, well, we need to think of this uh, in terms of mean squared error this time, because the, these expectations are not equal. So we can't just think about variance. We, our mean squared error decomposes if um, 
this is just a property of the mean squared error, it decomposes into the bias squared. So that's the difference between, the bias is the difference between, the expected difference between the these, no, it's not the expected difference, sorry, is the difference between these two expectations, even as n goes to infinity. That difference is the bias. And then we have the variance of the estimator, which is coming from the fact that this is now a random process from the sum of random variables. Okay, so we have bias squared plus variance gives us this mean squared error. And this is what we want to be fairly small. And roughly, informally, this is there's some abusive notation here. For the tower leaping problem, our bias is proportional, roughly, to tau. We shrink tau, we shrink the bias. Makes sense. The variance proportional to one on n, just like before with Monte Carlo. We increase n, we decrease the variance. Um, but we also have this cost factor. Um, and while it's deterministic for a given uh, tau compared to uh, Gillespie, uh, as we decrease tau, we're increasing our cost. So there's a trade off here between the bias we want, the variance we want, and the cost that uh, is going to be required. If we work out uh, the mean squared error we'd like, so let's say we want the mean squared error that's proportional to some h squared, and we want h to be small, um, that requires a cost proportional to n divided by h, which is proportional to 1 on h cubed. Um, and if you were to do the similar calculation with the unbiased with uh, Monte Carlo with the uh, Gillespie method, you would see that this just the cost is just proportional to n, and that would scale with one on h squared. Um, except that the, the cost of each n is, is potentially more expensive, so you need to take that into account. But the point here is that because of this poor scaling, this h cubed. For a sufficiently small mean squared error, eventually it, it could cost more than the exact simulation. Um, and the example that I have is here. So to just go through this plot, we have the, the log of the mean squared error along the bottom here. So we're starting with a um, uh, mean squared error around one down to 0.1. And then we have the compute costs in the y axis. So you can see the, the cost of these Monte Carlo with the Gillespie method and then the Tau Leap method. Um, we can see how the cost is increasing as we decrease our target mean squared error. And for Tau Leap, you can see that our initial savings as diminishing returns as we, as we increase the target mean squared error. If we wanted to go one more order less, wanted to go to 10 to the minus two, then Gillespie's going to be faster here. And if Gillespie was already not feasible to, to do that with, then Tau Leap is, is, is worse. So what we're wanting to do in multi-level, and the key idea of multi-level is to account, to try to, to fix this poor convergence um, for, the, for the Tau Leap method or in other methods as well. There's some situations where you won't have um, an exact simulation anyway. So that approximation say stochastic differential equations, this red line is just the best you can do. Um, so we want to be able to do that faster and, and not have to pay this penalty in, in the cost. We still have to pay a penalty, but we multi-level is a thing that that helps us uh, straighten these, these lines up. Okay, so now we actually get into some things about multi-level. And the key idea, and this is the play on words uh, described before, is this multi-level telescoping sum. And this uh, really, this is Mike Giles's idea. This goes back to 2008. Um, a very influential paper in operations research. And it's been cited almost one and a half thousand times. So it's, there's a lot of work deriving from this idea. 
And in the context of the uh, the problem we're looking at at the moment with Taulip and Gillespie, we're going to define this uh, sequence uh, L goes from zero up to capital L, and we're we're going to say that ZL is a tau leap approximation to X of T. So this is our Gillespie simulation using a, a time step tau that looks a bit like this. So it's some, some integer M, whatever that is, to the power of negative L. So that what that means is that um, tau zero is some really large step. And then tau one is that step divided by m, and then tau two is that previous step divided by m, and so on. So you get something that looks a bit like this. So this is an example for l equals three and m equals two. Uh, tau naught, um, tau one. So this interval is tau one. This interval is tau two. This interval is tau three. So you have these nested divisions of tau, this grid refining. Okay, so after defining that sequence of approximations, uh, we think about it a little bit and we do some things that initially seem a bit odd. And we say, let's start off with our, I guess our low bias approximation. So we choose our capital L, so this tau is really what we wanted. So let's say it's too expensive, but that, this is what we wanted. We can rewrite this, exactly so this there's no approximation here we can rewrite this as a slightly more biased approximation using the the previous level so coarser grid coarser time steps um, plus this bias correction because expectation is a linear operation so we can apply this there's no problem with equality here okay and we can do it again so we're going up another level and now we have two bias corrections and we keep on doing that until we have some incredibly biased approximation plus a whole bunch of bias corrections. Now, the first time I saw this, I think the first time a lot of people see this is they go, why does, is this a good idea? Because surely you're just complicating things because if uh, these variables are independent, so if ZL and Z minus L are independent variables, then the, the variance of the differences is just the sum of the variances. So we're actually making the problem worse, not better. Um, but there, there is a nice trick, which is this, this is the, the thing that if there's nothing else that uh, the people get out of this talk, this is, this is the, the key thing that, from this talk. And it's this idea of coupling the simulations. And so, depending on the application, this will be this will be different. But in the case of tau leap, we can do this by noting, and this is a detail I omitted before. But these y one to y m, so these are the counts for each reaction over a time interval tau. Uh, these are Python random variables. Now, they're they don't have constant rate. So over a time interval, they're assumed constant because of the tower leaping method. But in the, in the exact form, you, you would have a, a non-homogeneous Python process because you have uh, the, the state of the system is involved in that rate. So it depends on the propensities. Um, but over this time interval, they're, they're treated as constant rates. And Python random variables have this nice property where if you have two Python random variables with uh, different rate parameters, the sum of them is equal to another Python process that, that with rate, it's just the sum of the rates. So what this allows us to do, and omitting details, but this allows us to basically take M steps of our finer grid. So do a simulation on our finer grid and then use that, uh, the, those M steps in different intervals to generate one step of the previous level, the, the coarser grid. 
And why would we want to do that? Well, what that does is it generates a pair of paths on the two different levels that represent uh, different tau leap approximations of the same underlying exact path. So we have some exact realization that comes from our Gillespie. And then we imagine that we somehow have all the randomness that's, that was involved in that. And we use all of that randomness to generate two equivalent simulations at the different grid resolutions. As though we had done them separately, but we somehow have this extra information conditional on the exact path underneath. We're choosing the same exact path that these two relate to, even though we haven't simulated an exact path. And this doesn't uh, violate the telescoping sum. So all those terms will cancel out nicely still. It, it still has the same bias as our, as our finest tau that we choose, the capital L. Okay. That's pretty cool. I, I, I think it's pretty cool, um, but I haven't explained to you why it's useful. Um, this is a graphical example. Uh, so we have our realization. This is a different uh, network to before. We have a realization at tau one, and this is our couple realization for tau um, with time step two. So here, m the scaling factor is two, and we're going from the finer grid to the coarser grid, and then to a even coarser grid, tau being four, and even coarser grid, grid tau being eight. Now this. The computational cost of this is effectively just the cost of doing the fine grid. Once you have the fine grid, you can update the others almost deterministically. There's a tiny, um, there's some extra stuff involved, but but it's it's pretty much deterministic. So we can go through this process of generating these coupled paths, which is cool. But the real reason why this is useful is that it induces a positive correlation between these two uh, realizations in the pairs. And so that means instead for correlated random variables, that the difference of two correlated random variables is the sum of the variances minus the covariance between them. So if this is positive, then this gives us a variance reduction in whatever bias correction estimator we're going to do here. Now here I've now indexed the uh, number of samples with the level index L as well. Uh, so the idea here, here is that if this uh, correlation is strong enough, then perhaps we can get a variance reduction on this to need smaller samples for the, the expensive L's. So the, the, the larger values of L's or the smaller tau, we're hoping that we can deal with that. And it turns out with quite a lot of, uh, of maths to dig through, but if you do dig through it, you can eventually show that the variance of this bias estimator is proportional to, again, the inversely proportional to the the number of samples, but it's directly proportional to the time step tau. And that's really, really useful because it means that as tau gets smaller, this variance is, is also decaying along, so that you need a smaller number of samples for the same target variance. And so we do the same sort of thing is before we think about we want this mean squared error to be proportional or something like h squared um, we can optimize our capital l and our sequence of samples and lowercase l uh, we can optimize these to to uh, give us this this rate in a more optimal way and the this is what you get out of it and you don't really need to know the details here except that this basically represents a balance between computational cost, uh, bias and variance. So balancing those all out optimally, um, the details are basically 
uh, Lagrange multipliers and a whole lot of applications of Jensen's inequality. Uh, if those terms mean anything to you, then you should be able to go through the analysis for this and show that this, this is what you, what you arrive at. And this has an interesting impact on the cost. So it actually breaks down into three special cases, which I won't go into the details of, but the results of each of these cases are as follows. We can actually achieve this optimal convergence that's exactly the same as our exact um, exact rate. So it's almost like we've completely lost the penalty from having that, that poor scaling as, as we saw before. So we can choose whatever uh, tau we want. It'll still, the, the simulations will still be more expensive, but that scaling in mean squared error is not going to be penalized because of the uh, in increased cost of that. Uh, we have this smaller penalty version where it's also scaled by the square of log h, the target mean squared error. And then we have this worst case scenario, which is actually still better than the, the uh, directly using the tau, tau leap um, estimator because this is strictly, this delta here is strictly between zero and one. So no matter how large delta is, it's still smaller. Of course, it may not be large enough to be valuable at times, uh, but the point is that this will always give you some sort of speed up it, for this problem. There's, there's more to it in other problems. Um, and for this particular application, we end up in the middle case. So recall this, this plot uh, before, we wanted to straighten up this red line. Uh, when we apply multi-level Monte Carlo to the exact same problem, this is what we get. So we get this almost order of magnitude improvement in computation, uh, in computational costs, and the convergence rate is pretty close to parallel with the, with the direct unbiased uh, estimator. So it's almost like we just got this saving from applying tau leap plus some multi-level stuff. Um, and the further we wanted to take this, the better it would become in terms of speed up between the naive tau leap and the multi-level estimator, because these just continue to get further and further apart. And if you don't have the blue line for some applications like stochastic differential equations in finance, for example, we don't have the blue line. Uh, so this, this is an enormous saving, which, is really cool. So this is this is this is in a nutshell what multi-level gives you is this uh, reduction in the order of convergence of your Monte Carlo estimator, which you know that there, there's still conditions, and I haven't been able to got, go through all of those. Um, but for a lot of like biochemical networks um, applications in finance. This works really well um, and it's been used heavily. There's more papers than I can keep up with on this sort of thing, particularly in finance. Um, there's, so we've, made, we've pretty much all, all we've talked about so far is the multi-level for the forwards problem. Uh, so basically none of this is my, is any of my work at this point. Um, I, I, came across this um, material long after all this stuff was done. Um, there's a lot of other things that have, that have also been developed since then. Uh, for example, in, in the case of Gillespie and Towley, you can completely remove the bias in the multi-level estimator, which is really cool. So no matter what L you choose, you can do an exact correction as well, where you can couple a Gillespie simulation to a tally simulation. So you can, you can almost take things down to a point where you only need one or two Gillespie simulations and then all the rest is tally and you have no, no bias. Uh, there's extensions using adaptive time stepping and, and other schemes like implicit schemes, higher order schemes like Milstein and things like that. Um, they have different convergence properties uh, and there's been a lot of work looking at those. 
a lot of work on extending the problem to uh, functions f that are not so nice. So I, I didn't mention before that for that expectation, the, the f there uh, has slightly stronger restrictions than a general Monte Carlo uh, estimator, um, but you can deal with that. And so there's been work um, dealing with those other cases. Multi-index Monte Carlo, which looks at stochastic PDE. So this is more like a spatial component. So you have levels in two different dimensions. And then another big idea um, is this idea of a randomized bias correction, which allows you to do unbiased estimation for problems where you don't have the exact simulation. So stochastic differential equations again, if you use something like Euler's method or similar, you can actually use this approach to correct for the bias. And this is basically multi-level with a randomized uh, bias correction step. Now I'm going to move a little bit uh, in a different direction. So I hope I haven't bombarded people too much. Um, but in a nutshell, we've now gone over the, the key workings of why we want to do multi-level Monte Carlo and the basic principles of, of how it works. Um, in, a, in an example as well, uh, well-trodden, which is biochemical uh, networks with Gillespie and Tally. Um, my research, particularly in the early parts of my PhD, was looking at multi-level for inference. And the context is like, like this. So we still have an expectation that's pretty much like we were looking at before. But the key thing is the distribution that we're integrating with respect to here is the Bayesian uh, posterior distribution. So we have some data D and we have some model um, with parameters theta. And so we have the, I guess, what we learn about from the uh, about the parameters given the data uh, proportional to this likelihood so probably of data given the parameters and some prior so this is the integral we're dealing with and it's a little bit more challenging than the than the uh, previous examples in terms of multi-level now we can of course just use pen and paper math and write down a telescoping sum the same way, but we really need to think about what this means. I mean, this you can always do this. Uh, so this in of itself is not necessarily a good idea, as we said before. Um, in this case, we need to think about what the levels represent. Uh, how do we sample from each level? Uh, that can be challenging. Do we have any sensible coupling mechanisms? And do they cause enough of a variance reduction? The, all of this can get really tricky. And there's a lot of work, including my work and others, that have tried to tackle this problem from different angles. Um, the application I looked at was, again, in biochemical networks. So we're trying to infer the rate parameters. We have some observation error uh, on top of the, the underlying stochasticity. But then we also generally don't have many observations. And all of this leads to the likelihood function in Bayesian's, uh, ba the Bayesian posterior to be intractable, or at least sort of. There's, there's, you can get somewhere with matrix exponentials, but it's generally speaking pretty, uh, you'd almost consider it intractable. And so because multi-level was good for the forwards problem, we think, well, maybe it will do something for the inverse problem, the Bayesian uh, expectation parameters. Uh, it turns out to be really hard, but the way we approached it was to think about, and I'll go through this a lot faster uh, because there's, there's more details in this section and I can't go through all the nuts and bolts, but uh, this is, this is the, the big idea, I guess that we use approximate Bayesian computation, which Chris has spoken about in this same seminar series last year. Uh, and basically we have some distance metric row. We create, uh, I'll show the algorithm here. 
we basically sample the uh, a parameter from the prior, then we use our underlying simulator, so let's say Gillespie, plus the observation error to generate some uh, simulations given that uh, value of the parameters. And then we either we look at under some metric how far away it is from the data. And if it's within some threshold epsilon, we say, yep, that's good enough as a sample from the posterior distribution. And we repeat that. So this scales really badly. <laughs> the acceptance rate decays like this. Um, epsilon to the minus Q, where Q is the dimensionality of the data. So that's it, it, the acceptance rate drops off really quick. Um, here's a simple example where we have some data. Just to show you what's happening, we do a simulation that gets rejected. Another one for a different rate parameter that's rejected. This one's a bit closer, it's close enough, except that even though that's not our true um, rate. Okay, so multi level, what we've done is we've taken a sequence of acceptance thresholds. Uh, so that yields a sequence of ABC samplers, uh, which yeah, as epsilon gets smaller, this gets more and more expensive. So we want to minimize how many samples we need to draw of the smaller epsilons. The key thing here is that we target initially a particular Monte Carlo estimator, which is the cumulative distribution function. So we actually target the multivariate cumulative distribution function and we do some extra things with our bias correction here, which is, I can't go through, but basically we have a continuous approximation to this uh, stepwise function that gives us that probabilities. And we're doing this in multiple dimensions. So this is the multi-level uh, telescoping sum. Uh, to do our coupling, we need to think a little bit more creatively. And that's to note that when we're computing the bias correction term for level L, we already have an approximation at L minus one for the CDF. So we're going to sample a bunch of samples from level L, which is the more expensive one. We're going to calculate some weights, which is basically based on the empirical distribution at this uh, for these samples. Uh, so there's some minimum L here, N we need here, but we won't go into that part. Um, and then we generate, just using the, the marginals here, we take the marginals of this um, previous estimate with the marginals of the empirical distribution here. And we use the inverse CDF idea to generate samples in each of the marginals only. And we use that to couple at least with respect to the marginals. This gives us a variance reduction, which is which is useful, the, but there is some additional bias that comes from this because this is, these are just marginals and not the full CDF. Um, I can talk more to people about um, the things you need to think about to decide whether this is a good idea or not. But uh, in the univariate case, it, it works. So, but in the multivariate case, you do need to think about your sequence of epsilons for this. Um, a tractable example, which, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. We have an SIS model. So this is, you know, um, we're familiar with these sorts of things. Infected people infect susceptible people and they recover. Um, we have an analytical solution to this. The key plot I wanted to show you was this one, where we have ABC rejection and the multi-level rejection, and we see the same improvements in the uh, root mean squared error convergence here. So that's really nice uh, uh, evidence that this thing's behaving the way we expect. And this is with respect to the real answer. So we know the solution here. We can't, um, there will be a lot of cases when you use ABC, you don't have the exact answer. Um, so this is more like the, the stochastic differential equation case where we, we don't have the answer. All right, basically this has been applied to lots of other areas, Markov chain Monte Carlo, sequential Monte Carlo, particle filters, likelihood and likelihood free. Um, 
Multi Fidelity Monte Carlo, which is an extension to the randomized bias correction idea. Uh, lots of different applications. And finally, what I'm currently working on in collaboration with Tom Prescott, Ruth Baker, and Matthew Simpson is combining the multi fidelity method with multi level um, to get better, even better improvements because they, they look at different aspects of the problem and it, we're getting quite nice results, which I don't get to go over at the moment. But, um, but this is support from my um, lift off fellowship through Australian Math Society and also some of my time from uh, CDS. Here's some references and the key one is look at this one. This one from Mike Charles that summarizes things really well. Lots of maths there though, but you, you can get through it and it's well worth it. Thank you. Thanks, David. That was um, a really great presentation on multi-level Monte Carlo. I think it, it's going to really help help our um, help our listeners understand that method. Hopefully. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to um, type them into the chat. So, at the moment, we haven't. Oh no, we just got a question popping in now, actually. So, this question is from Josh, and he asks, "Can you say anything about how?" multi-level Monte Carlo is used in SMC, sequential Monte Carlo. Okay, um, it has been used. So if you look at AJ Jajla, Jajla is the, the key person doing this sort of stuff. And the only thing I can say is, well, the broad idea is that there's still an approximation required. So you can't optimally solve the, the optimal n and you have to be careful that you don't hit some minimum n as well where particle degeneracy and things like that can can break telescoping some as well so you have to be a bit careful um but the coupling basically comes out of the the way the proposals are, are working so your mcmc updates they couple the mcmc updates um the similar idea with particle filters and you also have this nice idea of um, surrogate Markov chains to do the same thing with Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, where it's like you do one, one chain just in one dimension and you can use that to infer a coupled chain in two dimensions and so on. And that can get a nice reduction as well. But in all cases, it's a lot, but both my work and, and the other methods as well, it's a lot harder to be confident that you arrived at a sufficiently accurate estimate um, without, uh, you need to do some scaling experiments. You can't just go, yep, I'm going to run it once and that's good enough. You, you do have to experiment a bit. So there's, there's more tuning involved, but if it's something you have to do a lot of times, it's really worth it. Thanks a lot, David. Um, so maybe if, if there's no more questions for the meantime, maybe I can ask one. Um, so what do you think are sort of the key ingredients for multi-level Monte Carlo to work well? And how difficult is it to find these key ingredients in new applications? Yep. Um, knowing that you have a coupling scheme in your simulations is really important. So for forwards problems, uh, I, I would I'd be very confident in it, particularly if it's a stochastic differential equation or discrete state Markov process, that that's, there's a lot of, we, we know how they behave. You've got strong convergence properties that is, is nice. Inverse problems are much, much harder. Um, so you need to know and this, there's still research being done on this, but ultimately the major difficulty is if you have a system where the kurtosis is high on the bias corrections, even if you're coupling, even if you've got no additional bias, that can, that increases the cost a lot. And that delta that I showed in the worst case, that gets really close to one. So that's almost useless. So. Uh, you, you do need to experiment a little bit with the system you're, you're playing with. Um, I also didn't talk about how in practice you 
um, you choose L and, and N, the sequence N. So I showed the optimal choices, which are asymptotic, but you can, you can convert those into something practical, but you've got to do a little bit of like trial simulation to get some, get some approximate numbers that don't need to be accurate. And then you refine them as you do simulations. So it's a bit of, it's a bit adaptive in that sense. In terms of deciding whether you go down the route of using multi-level or not, um, it's always to me, whenever I've used it, you always need to be hitting a computational barrier already or you need to do it a lot of times. Mm, mm. Uh, so for mathematical finance, it's a brilliant method because of mm. just the number of high precision estimates that are for all intents and purposes unbiased because you can get that step so small in effect, but most of your simulations are not doing that. Mm, okay, okay. Is it also difficult to work out how many samples that you need to take for each level? So I, I know in that in the um, in that kinetic example, you could come up with some nice theoretical expressions for how yeah. you should choose that. Just sort of in more general applications, is it difficult to work out what's the best way to choose the sample sizes there? So the optimal rates that I showed for L and the sequence they're actually not dependent on having a expression for the rate of the bias correction. So they were just written in terms of, if you know the variance exactly, then you can, then you can come up with an exact optimum sequence. But most of the time you do some trials of each level, so a small number of trials of each level, let's say a hundred at each level, that rough estimate of the costs per sample and the, the variance of the bias corrections. And then you can do some quick like estimate, well, what, what's my optimal sequence or the scaling factor of the, that sequence. So if I start with a million samples, my really coarse inaccurate thing, then my next bias correction, you need, um, you know, 500,000 or something. And then so on. So is it halving or quadruple? Like, uh, quartering or something mm. and and then once you've got once you're happy with that the consistency of that scaling and then then you can start to rescale everything by that and and get the variance down mm, okay yeah that makes sense um okay so i i think we're out of questions now so thanks very much again david for a really great presentation it was a really interesting talk on multi-level monte carlo i'm sure many people are going to get excited in, in this method now and see if they can <laughs> think about if they can get it to work in their particular application so thanks again david that was really great and thanks every um thanks everyone for joining us again and um hope to see you next time thanks bye thanks bye bye